Let us pray. Holy God, we do indeed come to you with gratitude in our hearts for your word because we know that at all times it, it, it shapes us. Help us to be people open to being shaped in your loving, shaping capacity. In Jesus' name, amen. How do you do, how do each of you do with limits? When you see something that you, you want to have, but no, you really shouldn't, how do you do, how are you at holding back? As we all know, little children are not very good at holding back. Arguably, the most important thing that a child learns in growing up is how to hold back, how to not grab for everything in front of them. I remember seeing a young mother walking around the neighborhood, a member of the church with her little boy, under two, and it took her... She, I, Lynn and I were watching, and then eventually I was driving in my car and, and talked with her, um, it took her, she might have gone 100 yards, maybe it was 50 yards. It probably took an hour with her little boy because he had to touch and look at everything. We have been created, and this has some beautiful aspects to it, we have been created with an inbred desire to experience the joys and the beauty of creation. We are created as curious, curious beings who want to experience creation. And this comes at the very beginning of our journeys. And the question is, the question, however, is, that's framed this morning is, how are we at holding back? How are we at limits when limits are placed on us? From the very beginning of the Bible, we can see that God was very concerned about this, very worried about this. Because our reading today, our first reading, is right at the beginning of the Bible. It's, it's the second creation story. It's in the Garden of Eden. You got Adam and Eve and the serpent, and you've got this, this forbidden fruit. And complicated though that story is, and it is, there's so much to talk about. At its most basic level, it shows that the Bible, it shows the concern of the Bible right out of the gate about our very human tendency to not just want to touch things, but want to want to take things that we've been told not to take, or in this case of this story, to be disobedient to God. Right out of the gate, we see Adam and Eve giving in to temptation. And it's, so it's a story, Adam and Eve, us, our difficulty with our limits and the temptation of sin. Our 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet, it addresses this same concern. But it does so very differently than the previous commandments, especially the previous five. Think about them. Honor your parents, don't murder or commit adultery or steal or bear false witness against a neighbor. But this one is different because it isn't about an action. It's about the thought that, that leads to the action. And so what God is doing in this 10th commandment is especially going, wants to go inside of us, wants to nip these tendencies in the bud and wants us to be cognizant, wants us to be aware of these tendencies and help protect ourselves this way. God wants to protect us from these negative instincts. And so how are you? How are you at limit keeping? or Not wanting to take what you shouldn't take. Hopefully, hopefully, we all do well on that category. Ah, but how are you at not even wanting, not even desiring to take what you shouldn't take? 
Friends, it's one thing to regulate our actions. It's another thing to regulate our desires. But wait a minute. I, maybe. Is there a footnote somewhere in this Bible? Is there a footnote that says, you know, uh, 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 you know, if you're on a menu, you, you, that doesn't mean you can't look at the, at the or see, if you're on a diet, that doesn't mean you can't look at the menu. Is that anywhere in the Bible? I don't know. But I'll tell you, it's not here. It's not in the Ten Commandments. What it says is, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, ox, donkey, slave, house, anything. Anything? Really? It says anything. Well, I got to confess that if that's the case, and it's clearly the case in the Bible, I am in deep trouble. I'll just for starters, and, and for example, I'm just going to admit this up front. We pastors, we covet the members of other churches. <laughs> this ain't easy. The bar is being set very high. We really do have to ask, how do we possibly deal with our longings? And they pretend they're not there. These longings inbred from our childhood. Is it even possible to satisfy God, to live by the letter of the law in this one, to give up coveting? Well, let's start out here by reminding ourselves that we worship, and it's the same place we started when we did the first of the Ten Commandments. Let's start out by reminding ourselves that we worship a forgiving God. Demanding, yes, but also forgiving. We worship a Lord who tells us when we pray to ask for forgiveness. Forgive us our trespasses. But it's also important to notice that in that same prayer, Christ tells us to pray, lead us not into temptation. Christ knows, having God walking in our shoes, knows the challenge of curbing our desires, our coveting. Christ knows that our desires for the good things of life, the good stuff of creation, that these desires can get out of hand. And Christ knows that we need help with our limits. And he tells us where to look for help, to look upward. And that's the same message we get from the Apostle Paul in our reading today from Philippians. Paul is writing to, unquestionably, it's just clear in this letter compared to his other letters, this is his favorite church. It's in the Macedonian city of Philippi, and he has a special bond with the people of this church. And our words today reflect that. And they, they, they reflect Sort of this amazing, and, and the result of that is sort of this amazingly hopeful and these faith filled words, words of gratitude, which is all the more moving and inspiring because he's writing from a prison cell. He writes, he has the audacity to write, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice from a prison cell likely in chains. It is likely that Paul has been in prison, and not for the first time, mind you, multiple times. He's been in prison for the simple act of sharing his faith. He could have complained about being unfairly in prison, but instead he does the opposite. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And so maybe you want to ask Paul, seriously, what are you so happy about? What are you rejoicing about? How could you possibly be so content with what you have, with your life at that moment? From what I can see, Paul does not have a lot at that moment and otherwise. 
And as he traveled around, he was being constantly harassed. His life was brutal. What's your secret, Paul? Why? Why are you so content? <laughs> I'd like to know. And thank God, Paul basically tells us. It's a little abstract. There's some meat on the bone, but he tells us here. Among the things he says in this reading is, I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little. I know what it is to have plenty. And in any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of having plenty and being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In other words, Paul too is saying, look upwards. Paul was this guy who, he was a very hard case. He had, years before he'd been, and this is, we know this. He'd been an eager persecutor of early Christians. This guy was not doing good stuff. And yet he found forgiveness for being a persecutor. He found redemption in meeting Christ on that road to Damascus. And his life changed immediately. He found gratitude in by just that simple, or not so simple, being forgiven. And it changed him. Because Christ enabled him to change. Still, my guess is that Paul is as human as the rest of us, and he must have at times had his moments of coveting things. He doesn't really talk about it, although he talks about his own flaws a lot. But he clearly learned how to deal with it by remembering, by remembering how grateful he was to God. Grateful for even and maybe especially the small things difficult in, in difficult times, like being in prison, like being grateful. There is some specificity here. It's in, it's, it's, it's in the breadth of the letter and only slightly implied in our reading. He's grateful to his friends, he calls them beloved, from Philippi, who had actually gone, come from Philippi to, we don't know exactly where he is, but he's probably... In, in Caesarea, we don't know for sure, but they, it's a, they've come a long distance to bring him gifts. And that's part of what this letter is about. He found a way to be grateful for what he had in that moment and generally what he had, rather than focusing on what he didn't have. And so when he says, Think on these things. He gives this great long list of, of, of things that are good and commendable and worthy of praise. Think of the positive things. In those words, we see a man who reoriented his heart toward gratitude. On the surface, Paul was an unlucky man. And yet he came to find this new life full of gratitude not just at this moment, but in this terrible moment he was experiencing. Can there be any doubt that he believed for certain in his heart that God was with him in that prison cell at that moment of trial and difficulty and sadness and frustration? Now, I don't know about you, I could guess about a lot of us, but I do know about me. And I can slip into moments of coveting. And I can also tell you it does not feel good. Coveting, whether you act on it or not, is unhealthy. In fact, I'd argue it's debilitating and sometimes can be even, it can even cause despair in us. And so I, like countless others, I am deeply grateful for the example of this man, Paul, and for his guidance here. Because his words really are like a reminder that we can keep in our own hearts to remind ourselves when things are difficult and sad and hard, including like right now. We can remember to turn to God and 
gratitude. I know this because I do get in those kinds of moods and I, Paul helps me remember. Today, Paul tells us his secret and it's not complicated. And it's the same secret that Jesus gives us, which is to look upwards, to look to God who is the home, the foundation of true contentment. I was going to end the sermon there. But right before the sermon, thinking about the words, thinking about the reading, thinking about the, the, the piece that Jerry sang called Gratitude, I decided to write on each page of this sermon, audacity, audacity. That's what this reading really is. This is a man who had the audacity to be grateful in terrible circumstances. A wonderful lesson for all of us. Amen.